And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. The Egyptians are, um, the Israelites have fled um, captivity and they get to the Red Sea. It's where God has led them to. And now they're at a dead end. And now they're at this moment looking behind them and seeing the army of Egypt chasing after them. There's nowhere for them to go. It's over. Just turn to the person next to you say it's over. It's over. Genesis 37 verse 23. Um, So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty and there was no water in it. Joseph had declared a dream that the God had given him, and then out of that he um, his brothers get jealous, they get angry with him, they plot to, to murder him, to kill him, and um, they rip this co- coat which his, the father has given him, and they rip it off of him, and they throw him into a pit. It, it's over. Turn to the person next to you, just say, it's over. <laughs> it's over. And 1 Samuel 17 verse 4 And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines um, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come up? Um, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, Then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that may fight together. Then Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine. And they were dismayed and greatly afraid. It's over. Turn to the person next to you say, it's over. (laughs) Like, like, let them know, like, it's over, guys. It's done. It's done. The, the, the person scored the goal in the last minute. It's over now. You know, it's over. It's done. There's no way we're coming back from this. It's done. Matthew 26, verse 69. Now Peter sat outside of the courtyard, and the servant girl came to him saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out of the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth, but again he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who has said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and he wept bitterly. It's over. The title of today's message is, When Over is Overrated. Now in hindsight, many of us know the outcome of some of these stories. But when you are in there, when you're in it, there's no hindsight, is there? When you're in these situations and it feels like it's just over, we don't get the big picture. 
We don't see what is ahead. We just see what is in front of us in that moment. And it looks pretty much like it's over. I just want to remind you today and encourage you that over is overrated. Joseph has a dream. The sharing of this dream led him into a pit. Isn't that crazy? Isn't it crazy that, that God gives somebody a dream? God, it comes from God. So pure, so amazing, so incredible. How many people here are asking God to speak to them? You know, Lord, speak to me. Give me a vision. Give me a dream. Show me. And God does these amazing things. He downloads. He pours in. He gives you dreams and, his, and visions. He gives you insight sometimes into what's ahead. And yet Joseph gets this and he has this amazing gift. And all he does is share it with the people that he's closest to. And a few days later, he's just sat at the bottom of the pit, stripped bare, stripped naked. And he's looking up. How did this happen? This wasn't the dream that I shared. This isn't, this isn't how I thought it was going to turn out. How am I in the pit? How have I lost my coat that my father gave me? How am I beaten and bruised? How am I here when just a few days ago all I did was share what God had given me? Sometimes church, in fact many times church, when you start out on your journey with God and God starts um, pouring into you his heart for your life, you will end up in many pits. And you'll be thinking, this is not why I signed up for this, Lord. When I said, here I am, send me. When Rich was at the, the church that day and he, and he gave that scripture and he said, who else is here? Who's with me? He'd say to the Lord, here I am, send me. And I was like, yeah, I'm saying that too. This was not what I had in mind. I didn't realize I was getting thrown into the pit. I, all I did was share your dream. All I did was share a bit of what I felt like you were telling me. And now I'm here. I don't understand, Lord. Maybe the dream is over. Maybe you got the dream wrong. Maybe it wasn't even God. Isn't this the stuff that goes through our minds? Do you know why? Because God doesn't give us a dream and then fulfill it in the next day, does he? We would like him to. But what happens is he gives us something. Just open the crisps. Go for it. Okay, go on. Just... <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure you share it with someone. Okay. Right. <laughs> Isn't it worse when you try and open the packet of Chris quieter? It's cool. If you're new here, if you're a visitor, it's very normal to bring snacks to my preachers. They're two hours long usually, so it's cool. The Israelites cried out in prayer, God sends Moses. God uses Moses to perform amazing miracles. Through those miracles, they are delivered from captivity, from slavery. And then God, and it is God, by the way, go and read it, leads them to a dead end. God tells Moses where to go. Do you know this? He says, go to the beach. Go to the beach. Now, if, he's, if God's telling me to go to the beach, I'm like, amen, let's go to the beach. I'm taking my volleyball. So maybe they had the same mindset. He's like, wow, he's going to let us go to the beach. But they, they go to the beach. They get to the sea. And there's nowhere to go. There's just this huge sea in front of them. And now, behind them, is the Egyptian army closing them down. It's over. But Lord, this is not what I pray for. When we pray for deliverance, we, we prayed. And then you sent us Moses. And we weren't sure about this guy at the time. Because first of all, he got us to do extra hard work. We, he went to Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh said no. And then he made the Israelites work harder. And they're like, why have you sent us Moses? He's, 
He's not the answer. But then they realize as Moses was faithful to God that he actually helped lead them out. But now he's led them to the dead end. This isn't what we prayed for. This is not what, how we want it to end. And this is what happens to them. They get to the point where like, why did you bring us here to die? Like, was there no graves in Egypt? Like, why have you brought us here? Why, why are we, well, how have we ended up here? It's over. The Israelites have been offered the ultimatum. Face the nine-foot giant. Send your greatest warrior. Winner takes all. Sounds great, but it, the Israelites don't have a nine-foot giant in their team. And this guy is vicious. This guy has got a reputation. This guy is going to rip whoever is apart. It's just going to happen because this is what this guy does for a living. Nobody wants to fight. And nobody believes in anyone else to be able to fight either. It says they were greatly afraid. I mean, to be fair, wouldn't we all be afraid in that moment? I mean, it doesn't really matter whether you're the one that fights the Philistine. The reality is we ain't winning it. So whatever happens next, you've lost. It's over. Peter stood with Jesus. He went everywhere with Jesus. He never left his side. But then when Jesus was taken, Peter lost heart. He was gripped by fear when asked, do you know Jesus? You look like somebody that knew Jesus. Are you that guy? I mean, the reality was, wherever Jesus was, Peter was. People knew this. For three years he was doing this. That's why in just a small group of people, three people recognized him as being somebody that hung out with Jesus. Peter was faithful. Peter stood by Jesus' side. Peter pulled his sword and chopped off the ear of one of the guards to protect Jesus. In those moments when he was with Jesus, he was he was with Jesus. But when Jesus got taken, Peter struggled. He has three chances to change his mind. Three chances to say, do you know what? No. I'm, I am. Yes, I am that guy. Three chances to acknowledge Jesus. But he gives in to fear. And then he ends up being filled with shame. It's over. Can you imagine Peter in that moment? Honoring God is it, the whole time they've been together. Honoring, honoring Jesus. Hanging with Jesus. Standing with Jesus. I'm never going to leave you, Jesus. And then in the very moment when Jesus is asking him, well, hang on a minute. Let's just see if you are going to stand with me. He fails. And he is filled with shame. Anyone else been in that place before? In that place with God at times where you feel like you've got to the point where you've let God down and this is it now. He's done. There's no way out of this. We know that Peter thinks this is the end. He goes back to his job. He knows that Jesus has even risen from the dead and he is just avoiding Jesus. He knows that, that Jesus will not want not any part of him. Why would he? He denied him. He is full of shame. He's let God down one too many times. Anyone been there? It's okay because over is overrated. <laughs> Genesis 41, verse 37. So the advice was good in the eyes of the Pharaoh and in the eyes of all of his servants. And the Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, 
In as much as God has shown you all of this, there is no one as discerning and as wise as you. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And the Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over the, all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand, put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Joseph, who was thrown into a pit, Joseph, who looked up and thought, where is this going? How have I got here? My own family have done this to me. Where do I go? This vision, this dream seems so wrong, so far away, so impossible. It's over. That same Joseph that sat in the prison because he honored God and he didn't give in to temptation is now in the prison. And he's just, again, how have I got here? This isn't the vision. This isn't the dream. Anyone been in the prison, not of your own making? You see, sometimes you can be put in a pit or a prison, and it's not because of what you've done. There's plenty of pits and prisons we put ourselves in. But there can be pits and prisons that you have ended up in because of others and you're thinking God all I did was honor you how am I here I mean how is it fair that Joseph by honoring God with his morals and saying I'm not going to give into this situation I'm going to stand for my God he doesn't give into temptation he runs from Potiphar's wife he ends up actually having the injustice happen to him where he becomes the guilty one when actually he's the innocent one. And because of that, he ends up being put in a prison, not of his own making, but through the making of somebody else's sin. How is that even fair? Let alone how far away is it from the vision that God has given him? And yet, over is overrated. Because here we read that in that prison, A door is opened. An opportunity arises. Where the gift that God gave Joseph that actually put him in the pit is able to be used. And he interprets the dreams of a couple of people that are in there. And through one of them, though he takes a little bit of a while to remind, remember, says there's a guy because Pharaoh has a dream and it freaks him out. And he says, I know a guy. He went from being the favorite child, clothed in many colors, to a pit, to a prison. But that prison was near the palace. And it led to him being able to come to Pharaoh and help Pharaoh through what he was struggling with. So much so. That Pharaoh says, you're in charge of everything. Only I am greater than you. And listen to this last 42. It says, then Pharaoh took off his ring, off his hand, and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen. I want to say your past may have stripped you naked and stripped you bare. Maybe you did it. Maybe somebody else did it. Maybe they took that garment off of you. But if you stay true to God, God will clothe you again. God will clothe you again. And he was clothed in garments of fine linen. <laughs> Genesis 14 verse 21. The Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went up into the midst of the sea on dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued 
and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. If God has led you to a place, okay, if you know that God has led you to a place and you're in this place right now and it seems like a dead end, it's just an illusion, okay? So I don't know if God has led you somewhere right now and you're thinking, but God, you pulled me here. I know this is where you want me to be, but I just don't see the purpose of it. I don't see where this is heading. I don't really understand the way ahead. It seems like it's a dead end. It seems impossible. If God has brought you there, it's for a reason. Trust him. He's never going, he doesn't, he doesn't bring you to a place and then leave you. He doesn't say, I'm going to take you there and then I'm off. He's going to fulfill the purpose behind why he wants you there. If he leads you to it, you can be certain he'll make a way through. It may seem like a brick wall. It may seem like there's a large sea. It may seem like there's this impossible situation in front of you right now. But if you know that it's God himself that's brought you there, he will make a way through. <laughs> he even promises he'll never leave you. You know those moments when you're in that place and you're like, this is a dead end. Where are you, God? It seems so quiet. Where, I don't see what you're doing right now. God's promise is, you might not even hear me. You might not even know that I'm here. But I, I, my promise is, I've never left you. I've never gone. I've never actually gone anywhere. He's always there. Always with you. He's never letting you go. He's never letting you down. And you can be sure that if he said it, he'll do it. So we can be in those places and it can seem like it's over, like maybe this is a dead end, maybe I took a wrong turn, maybe I misheard God, maybe something, but you know that you know that, you know that you're in the right place, but it just seems wrong in that moment. You need to know that God's about to part the sea. Because over is overrated. Genesis 17 verse 50, not Genesis, Samuel, 1 Samuel. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philist Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley to the gates of Ekron. When Goliath came out to challenge, what happened to the Israelites? It says they were greatly afraid. <laughs> David comes along. Doesn't God use the most unusual of things and the most unusual of people to sometimes answer the prayer and help you out of some of the situations? And you're thinking, I didn't pray for this. You see, if you think about it, <laughs> the Philist Goliath is basically saying, send me a man that is worthy of a fight with me. So what does God do? He sends a boy. This is how God works. Why? Because it ain't going to be for your glory. And, and so, so in this moment, the Philistines like, send me your greatest champion. Send me someone worthy of a battle. And do you know what David is actually there for? Why he's there? He's got a basket in his hand. And he's bringing his brothers, um, some sandwiches. His dad's like, take the sandwiches to your brothers. They're in a battle, even though, no, they weren't dad. They were actually hiding, but okay, fine. I'll take them. So he takes the basket and he gets there and he's like, what's all the commotion? He's just the boy. What's going on? And they're like, they're like, there's a fight going on. Do you not know? And he's like, yeah, but who's this dude? Like, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? Why is, 
Why is he saying such things about our God? And, and actually, why are none of you doing anything about it? They're like, oh, David, you're always getting involved. Give me my sandwiches. Mine's a BLT, you know? <laughs> Cheese and onion crisps. And a Diet Coke. Now get lost. But David's like, is no one going to fight this guy? See, God uses the most unusual of things and the most unusual situations. David comes along with a packed lunch. He's not even there to fight. But he's ready. <laughs> what about us? What about, are we always ready to fight? Are we already always ready to share the gospel when we need to? You might be there with a packed lunch in your hand thinking, well, I haven't got the Bible with me right now. But are you ready? Is the word in here? Is your relationship with God as it should be? David may not have been there for battle, but he was ready to fight. And so he turns up with a packed lunch. God uses the most unusual things, and then it gets better. It gets way better because what, what Saul actually gives in and says, okay, we'll send a boy in. I mean, it's crazy. It's literally because no one else is going to volunteer. No one, not even the king. In that moment, he's like, okay, well, Miles, we're going to lose anyway. You're expendable. We'll send you. Yeah? So he sends David. And David puts on the armor of the king and it's too big because he's just a boy. <laughs> so David's like, it's cool. Just give me some stones and a rubber band. And he walks out there and he's just, God uses the most unusual of things and he destroys a giant. It looked over, <laughs> but hey, over is, yeah, definitely. Maybe you've been suffocated by life. Maybe there have been giants of addiction in your life. Maybe you've been drawn towards suicide. It seems like the easiest way out. But there are people here today, when people said that that is it, it's over. Oh, hang on a minute. Isn't it overrated? Because you're still here. How about when you got the diagnosis from the doctor? How about the, he's not here today, but what about when the scans came through and said someone's got stage four cancer? Isn't that the, the end? Isn't it over? I mean, that's what the world says. It's over. It's done. It's finished. But over's overrated. Who's had a giant in their life that just seemed impossible to overcome? Did it seem like it was over? Did it seem like it was over? Just shout amen if you th it looked like it was over. Amen. Yeah, it looked over. But isn't that over overrated now? Yes. But do you remember at the time how over it really was over? How big that giant really was? How great it was? How impossible it was to overcome? But it, 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 you're still here. This message today is just to remind you that you may be in a situation again where it seems impossible that the giant is in front of you. It may look like it's over, but if God has already brought you through it and you're here today breathing when really maybe you should have been dead or maybe you should just be in a pit or maybe you should be in a right mess and yet you're here praising Jesus today, you're still breathing, then over really is overrated, isn't it? Acts 2. I'm just going to read a little bit and then I'm going to skip to 34. So from verse 14 it says, But Peter standing up with the eleven raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. These are not drunk as you suppose since it's only the third hour of the day. Verse 34. For David did not ascend to the heavens but he him says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter the, the, and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? And then Peter said to them, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are afar off. As many as the Lord our God will call. Who's let God down? I'm waiting for every hand to go up. Yeah, we've all let God down and we will let God down. We will make mistakes. It's okay. Because when I read Peter, Peter denies Jesus three times. Peter ends up having shame cloaked all over him. And yet, 50 days later, oh, do you like it? See, I, sometimes it's like, oh, no, you've got to go through two years of counseling before you can overcome something. 50 days later, not even two months later, Peter isn't carrying shame anymore. Peter is carrying boldness. And the very people that he was afraid of, the very same people that he was afraid of knowing that he was associated with Jesus, he is now preaching to them with boldness, saying, you need to repent because you killed the Messiah. And they respond with, what do we need to do? And he says, you need to repent. You need to get baptized and you need to turn. You need to receive the Holy Spirit so that you and your family will never be the same again. The same Peter, 50 days. Wow. You see what God can do for a life? What God can do for you? We've got to sit there and we've got to beat ourselves up. Oh man, I've let God down. And someone might come along to you and say, yeah, that, I've looked at the, the chart. For what you did to the Lord, that's going to take at least three years of repentance. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to admit? Right, that's actually six years and seven days for you. Can you imagine? Isn't that how we do it to ourselves? That almost that we have to, we put, put, put ourselves in a position where we end up almost saying like, I, I, how do I pay this back? How do I get this right? Well, you didn't pay it. <laughs> How did you pay God back? You didn't pay it. You didn't do it. He paid it. He paid it in full. <laughs> so isn't it incredible that God can take someone that's in shame? Who's ever been in shame before God? I have. Aren't you thankful that that God didn't just leave you in the gutter in that moment. And that now you're being used by God. And you could say, wow, I didn't even have to go through that, that, and that. I just needed to come and repent before God. And do you know what? The next day was just a new day. I was able to get up, dust myself off, and move on with God. Praying and hoping that I'll never fall into that pit again. <laughs> It seems like it's over, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Doesn't it seem like it's over? You know when you maybe have an addiction and you take that, that drug or you take that drink and you just think, oh my gosh, I've just done it for the 150,000th time. This has got to be the last chance. That must have been it. God must be done. He must be finished with me. Yeah? And God's like, what? Do you even understand my love for you? It's so wide. It's so far. It's so outreaching. You are never going to exhaust my love for you. Ever. The enemy wants you in the pit. Sometimes we want to be in the pit. But you just need to get up and dust yourself off. 50 days later, Peter stood up and he's like, do you know what? These guys can kill me because they killed Jesus. So if they can kill Jesus, they can kill me. But I am not afraid anymore. It's funny because about three days after Jesus' death, he's talking around about three days, maybe a bit longer. He's chatting to Peter. 
And even in that moment, so it's less than 50 days, Peter is still being honest with Jesus at that moment. He's saying, I don't think I can do what you do. I thought I could, but I can't. I don't think I can love with the love that you love me. And he says, you will. It's not, if you read Jesus, Peter's story, he is so messed up. And he's so far from God. He makes mistakes. And yet, when it really came to it, I mean, I didn't just put this in the message, but I'm going to do it now. He, he's in prison. Do you know what he's doing in prison? Sleeping. He's sleeping in prison. He's accepted. If this is it, Lord, I'm going to be with you soon. So I'm going to just have a nap. And why was he in prison? Because he wouldn't shut up about Jesus. The very same Jesus that he wanted to make sure nobody knew was associated to him. Just a few days before. But hey, over is overrated, is it not? John 19 verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Okay, so Jesus is put on a device known for torture and death, the cross. He is nailed to that cross. And just before he dies, he says these words, it is finished. Or I guess it is over. Only this over is different. Jesus is on a device that's meant to kill, it destroys, and it tortures him to death. That's what it does. It suffocates you to death. That's what it's designed for. It's a torturing device that will end in death. And yet, who is it that says this over normally? You? Satan? Others? The government? The news? YouTube? Oh, you are so messed up right now. It is over. You ain't getting out of this pit ever. It is over. Oh, Rich, you've messed up too big this time. You ain't getting out of this one. It's over. The thing is, those voices aren't the voices that are used on the cross. There's no Satan. There's no man. There's no government. There's no religious rulers saying these words. It's Jesus. So when Jesus says it is finished, when he gets to say it's over, it's a very different over to the one that is said over us, that we say over us. <laughs> the reason for this and the reason why you need to accept that Jesus is over, which actually when you look up means it's accomplished, it's complete. His over is different. It's not, it's messed up, it's broken, so it's done. It doesn't mean that. Jesus even says, knowing that all things are accomplished, he asks for some wine. He knows it's finished, it's complete. He has done it. And he just comes and he says, it's finished, it's complete. And he commits his spirit. And in that moment, what does he do? He trumps the over of our lives. You know the over that is over us? The over that says it's over and out, you're done. You know that over? It is finished, trumps it every time. That's why Jesus says it. Because it isn't coming from the enemy. It's not coming from you. It's not coming from, from some other source. It's coming from him. So when he says it, it is got a completely different meaning. Your over is overrated, yeah? But your over is also overruled. 
The news of Jesus' death was greatly exaggerated, by the way. I don't know if you've read it. See, people saw it. Jesus is dead. Jesus is in the grave. The stone has been rolled. It's over. It's complete. The seal is on the tomb. <laughs> it's, it's not over. It's, it's, this over has been completely overrated. Everyone thought that it was done. Everyone thought it was complete. Everyone thought that this Jesus actually, who was amazing, and they saw amazing things happen, actually was just another guy. And, and now he's in a tomb, and just like everyone else, he is dead. <laughs> Until three days later, there's no stone in front of the tomb anymore, and the tomb is empty. Anyone else had news from the doctor? Maybe the bank? Anyone else had that over that seems like it's complete, that the stone has been rolled in front, and it's been sealed, and it is done? Jesus trumped it. John 19, verse 28. Let's just read this again. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, that, that said, uh, he said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on his soup, and put it on his mouth, so that when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So the cross was meant as a device for torture. But through the crossover, sorry, I didn't mean to say, through the cross, through the cross over is overrated. Through the crossover. Through the crossover. That's cool, isn't it? <laughs> through the crossover. Did they, what did they do? Are they Israelites? Did they crossed over what? They crossed over the sea. You could say river, but that's just under, you know, it's not giving it its full thing, Nick, you know. <laughs> the sea, Red Sea. The Israelites crossed over from despair to victory. Joseph crossed over from pit to palace. The Israelites crossed over from fear to fearlessness. Peter crossed over from shame. To boldness. So the cross, what it really represents is that the cross is over everything. Doesn't it? The cross is over everything. Therefore, if we're talking about over, you know, the over I've been talking about all morning, yeah? The cross is over over. Yeah? Turn the person as you say, the cross is over, over. Yeah? It <laughs> I know. Next time, time someone times tries to tell you it's over, maybe it's a diagnosis. Maybe it's Satan himself. Maybe it's you. Remind yourself that the cross is over everything. Yeah, it's over everything. Like, Jesus' it is finished is a much greater over than the over that we usually believe and follow. Yeah? <laughs> Can I just show you one more thing? Just one more thing. It won't take very long. See, God loves to take what was meant to harm you and turn it for victory. Do you know that? God, God loves to do that. I just want to show you through this story, just this last little bit. But God loves to take what was meant to harm, what was meant to destroy, and he loves to turn it for good. Okay? The, the story of Joseph ends like this. Because what happens at the end of the story is that um, Jacob, who is Joseph's dad, he, he ends up coming to Israel. But Jacob is old, and eventually Jacob dies. Now... The brothers who threw him in the pit, Joseph in the pit, are so worried that now Jacob is dead that Joseph is actually going to punish them with the punishment that he deserve because now Jacob's not there to say, don't do it, okay? So they actually go to Joseph and they're like, are you going to, you know, you're going to now punish us the way that you, and he says, he says, guys, you're missing the whole point of what actually went on here. <laughs> See, he shared a dream 
that put him in a pit. But the pit led to the palace. And then he says these words in verse 20, 50 verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. You know when you sat in that pit? How have I ended up here? You just need to know it might not seem that great in that moment. But you need to know that God is already turning it for good. It may seem like evil. It may seem over. But you need to know that the cross trumps it. Okay, and, and actually God is already turning it for good. It's already being turned for good. It's a promise of God. God is already working on your behalf. He's already doing this. This is what he does. So the enemy took the pure, God-given, beautiful dream that was given to Joseph. And he used it. To corrupt others so that they would throw him into a pit. They actually, most of them wanted to actually murder him. But even in the midst of the enemy's schemes, remember he can only go as far as God allows him. So even in that moment, even though the enemy wanted to end it right there, we're not having that dream, it's over. God's like, no. Joseph is sold into slavery, but he becomes the best servant you can get because he honors God with his life. But because he honors God with his life, he ends up in prison. But through being in prison, he ends up having the door open to him to come to the Pharaoh, which leads to him being the most second most powerful man on the planet. And God uses him to save the whole world. The whole world. Do you think he was thinking that when he was sat in the pit or in the prison? That the next step was going to be saving the whole world? Church, you don't know what God's got for you. You just need to know he's got something. If you just follow his path, it will come and it will be good. Because even though evil will be involved along the way, God will take it and he'll turn it for good. So, so this is the lesson. He took what was pure. He took this dream. He took this gift, the enemy, and he tried to use it to get his own gain. But it's the very gift of dreams and having the interpretation of dreams that actually leads to him being put into the prison, but then actually ends up leading him out of the prison to the pharaoh. Do you see how the enemy tries to use the thing against you? And God's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to use the thing you thought you were going to use against them. I'm going to use it against you and your plans. I'm going to use it for my good, for my plans, for my glory. You see, the dream actually started the problem. But it's the dream that led Joseph to where he needs to be to see the fulfillment of that very dream. Goliath was nine foot tall, a huge man. It caused fear throughout the Israelites. Fair play. I mean, the guy's huge. Do you know what also a nine foot guy is? You see, he's the champion of the enemy, isn't he? He's like this. He is ferocious, all-powerful no man on the earth can, can match him for stature and power. So he's huge, which makes him a big target for a stone. Doesn't it? <laughs> you see, if you read it, he is showing off. They've even got all the details like cubits and how big his armor was. and It's all written in there. They're probably measuring him after he's dead. Eight and a bit foot without the head. Nine foot with the head. Yep. And they're measuring and weighing the armor. and All of it's in there. It, he was, come on then. Where are you? Come out. You know, where is your big champion? 
a scrawny kid, a boy. He was ruddy and good looking, I think. Is that right, Joe? Um, but he, he turns up with lunch. He grabs some stones and he takes on the giant. But really, the giant that so called is invincible is just a big target. You see, the enemy tried to pause, cause fear in the Israelites to, to paralyze them. But when David came along, all David saw was a big target for his sling and his stone. Do you see how, what, how the enemy wants to use something against you that causes you to have fear? But how God will use it for good. The Israelites in one moment looked like the water of the Red Sea was going to be the very thing that caused them to be defeated. They got to the beach. There was nowhere else to go. And the Egyptians are behind them. There's just a sea ahead of them. There's nowhere else you can go. It looks like the sea is the thing that's going to destroy them. Anyone ever been in a storm? It looks like the sea is the very thing that's going to lead them back into slavery. And yet Moses stretches out his hand and he parts the sea. And the Israelites walk through the sea to the other end. And then what happens? God uses the very thing that looked like it was going to defeat the children of God. He uses it to defeat the enemy because the enemy followed them in and the very water that looked like it was going to bring defeat to Israel brought a defeat to the Egyptians. Whatever is going on in your life and whatever you may be facing, whatever is surrounding you, I want to let you know, because God is, this is just what God does. He will use what seems like is going to destroy you. He will use it for victory. It's just what he does. Trust him. The cross, which was an instrument of torture and death. Yeah? Are we in agreement with that? Is now a symbol of hope and salvation. Is it not? Is it not? You see, Jesus took this very thing which he died on, which he was tortured on, but it's now not remembered for torture and death. It's remembered for hope and salvation. This is what God does. I don't know what you're going through right now, but your over is overrated. There would definitely be people in this room that were suicidal, and yet I'm thankful that your over is overrated because you're breathing today, and God said, no, no, no. I say when it is finished. Some of you are on operating tables thinking, is this the last time I'm going to see this world? And yet you're here today because God said no. Your over was overrated. Some of you are here today even though the diagnosis said you wouldn't be. Aren't you thankful that someone else's over was overrated? That a piece of paper was overrated? That a scan was overrated? If Jesus can take a torturing device and turn it as a symbol of hope and salvation. God can take your life in all of its mess, all of its brokenness, all of the struggle, and he can turn it for good. And you, you can walk around knowing the hope and the salvation of Jesus for your life because your over was overrated. But it's trumped by his, it is finished. It's the cross over everything.